Hello, everyone, and welcome back to a new episode of the Women's Franchise Committee podcast, Her Success, the Stories of Female Franchise Leaders. I am Cassidy Ford. I'm an account director at FRM Solutions, and I am joined today by the one and only Katherine Monson, who is the CEO of the newly formed Propelled Brands and the chair of of the International Franchise Association. So thank you so much, Catherine, for joining me today to share your story and your insights. Well, Cassidy, thank you for having me. I'm really honored to be here and uh, hope to provide some value to our listeners. Oh, I definitely think you will for sure. Uh, and I know a lot of people who are tuning in have uh, been aware or are aware of your many accolades. So I will not attempt to repeat them here. Uh, but what I would love to do today is dig deeper into how you have come into being the leader that you are today. So we can jump right in. How has overcoming the struggles of your early life helped you become the leader that you are? Well, that's an excellent question, and uh, not all of, of the po- folks uh, in listening to this podcast maybe know, but I grew up in an abusive alcoholic, alcoholic home. I had a really mean mother who drank a lot, and as the oldest child, she literally said, if you weren't such a bad child, I wouldn't have to drink. If you weren't such a bad child, I wouldn't be unhappy. If you weren't such a bad child, um, I wouldn't you know, be fighting with your father. And she didn't do that to the other three kids. She just did that to me. So on one hand, I was totally blessed that that was not given to my siblings. That was a good thing. Um, But, you know, when you get that kind of condemnation uh, as a young person, you can really start to internalize it and feel negative about it. And so in my 20s, um, I struggled with some depression. I got some very good help. Um, uh, The best help I got was from therapists that specialized in adult children of alcoholics. So if any of has uh, is an adult child of an alcoholic, that would be the kind of therapist I would go to somebody who is very experienced in that. But that really helped me learn about how to uh, cope and how to control my mind. And I think one of the decisions that I had to make early in my life was, do I want to be a victim or do I want to be a victor, right? And I think that that is a critical decision for everybody to make. Do I want to be a victim? Do I want to blame circumstances? Do I want to blame my upbringing? Do I want to blame that I'm a woman and it's a man's world? Whatever it is, wherever I'm putting blame, if you're blaming anybody other than yourself for your situation, you're being a victim. And if you embrace the idea that you are completely responsible for your own life, you're responsible for your own happiness, you're responsible for your own health, you're responsible for everything, you're responsible for your career, whatever it is that's important to you, the decisions you make are what is going to affect the outcome of that. And so I think that first decision is victim or victor is critical. And so I I really thought through that and decided I'm in charge of my happiness. I'm in charge of my career. I'm in charge of my life. Uh, And if there are areas I'm not happy about, like if I get up for eight, 10 pounds, I'm the one responsible. I'm the one that put the food in my mouth. I'm the one that didn't work out. I'm the one that made poor decisions. So I think that's key to my success is understanding I'm responsible for my life, my success, my happiness. And then, you know, also um, I had, uh, I grew up in a family business and starting at eight years old, my father and I would go on the weekends to the preschools and we'd mow the lawn and we would Uh, clean the kitchens and clean the toilets. And then as we drove to the schools, we'd talk about business. As we drove back, we'd talk about business. And every Saturday night after cleaning schools, we, I know this is going to sound funny, but we, all the school, all the preschools had a kitchen because a hot meal is very important for lunch. Um, We, uh, we cook organ meat. So like liver and kidneys and hearts because only dad and I like those, right? So we would have this nice dinner together that we would cook together in the kitchen, in the preschool, and we'd talk business. So that eight years old, nine years old, 10 years old, mowing the lawns, cleaning all the way through. And then as I got older, starting to work in the office of the preschools, that got me to fall in love with business. And by the time I was in high school, my vision of my career was to be the president of a big company. So I think one, I had a desire to lead. Um, You know, if I think about high school and college, whenever I was put on a project, 
in a vacuum, if nobody was taking leadership, I'd just step in and take leadership. I cannot turn that off. That's whether that's DNA or whether that's, you know, nurture rather than nature, I don't know, but I cannot handle, I'm not comfortable with a void of leadership. So maybe part of that is DNA, maybe part of it is how I brought up, but I was in love with business. I didn't want to be a victim. I wanted to be a victor. So then what do you do if you want to lead a company? Well, you better put yourself in those situations when you're le- where you're learning about management, you're learning about leadership, you're learning about how to understand financial statements and the importance of the balance sheet and cash flow and all those things that are so critical to leadership. And so I made sure that I got a degree in business management. And, uh, you know, I got my first job and, you know, six months into it, decided that wasn't the right job for me, got my second job. And three years into that, realized what I was doing would never get me to lead an organization. I better find a different kind of a job in sales or marketing. Uh, Because, you know, the three typical ways to get into leadership are engineering, and I'm not an engineer, uh, finance and accounting. And I understand all that, but it's not my passion or sales and marketing. So I went and found a Uh, a sales oriented job uh, with a small, I didn't even know what a franchisor was, but in 1980, a small franchisor called Sir Speedy Printing Centers. And I became part of the team that grew that from under 200 to over 850 locations. And so Mm. that's how I got started. When you talk about being responsible for your own life and, and taking charge of things, what would you say to people to differentiate between taking responsibility for th- something and then holding on so tightly you're trying to control it. Yeah. Cause you don't, you, you can't control, you can't control anything other than yourself. Right. Right. So if you're trying to control other people, you're, you're missing the point. The point is controlling yourself, how you spend your time, uh, your focus, your energy. Right. So I think, I think that's the difference. I'm in charge of myself and I need to control myself, but I can't control anybody else. I can't control my employees. I can't control my board of directors. I can't control my friends, right? You can't do any of that. I don't have children, so I can't say I can't control my children. So I can't (laughs) talk about children, but I think it's all about controlling ourselves and, you know, being um, good time managers and focusing on the most important things that are going to get the best results. And, And that actually works. Uh, if you want to be a parent for parenting, right? It, it works. If you want to be a pastor, it works. If you want to be a CEO, it works. If you want to be the best salesperson in the world, right? What are the skills you need to have? How do you manage your time so that you're con- d- getting more done, developing more, um, contributing more. So in my career, um, I always tried to provide more value to the company that employed me than I was paid. And if you do that, you provide more value than you're getting paid, you're going to find out that you're going to get promotions and you're going to get paid more. If you provide just as much value as you're paid, nobody's going to think about promoting you Mm -hmm. and paying you more. If you provide less value than you get paid, you're going to lose your job eventually, right? Companies can't, companies need to be able to make a profit. So they've got to have all the people they employ providing more value to the company, more productivity, more output than they get paid. Otherwise, the company can't make any money. When you talk about adding value, I know behind you is a sign and there are some acronyms or some abbreviations here on the sign. So tell me about that and how you've used those to guide your life and your leadership and add value. So let's back up. There, mm-hmm. you can see it. So PMA, GDB, SM, SOU, and NSL, which stands for positive mental attitude, goal-directed behavior, self-motivation, a sense of urgency, and never stopping learning. So early in my career, I had a mentor who believed that there were five common characteristics to all highly successful people. Those happened to be them. Uh, and as I listened to him, as I applied those to my life, as I looked at other successful people, it's absolutely true. So positive mental attitude or positive mindset is foundational. Nobody wants to follow somebody negative. Mm. And if you're filling your mind with negative thoughts, you're going to be down. You're not going to be, as, you're not going to think as well. You're not going to be as productive. You're going to be tired. You could actually, if you focus on negatives enough, you'll get yourself actually physically, clinically depressed, right? 
So one of the things I learned to do in my life is to fill my mind with gratitude and with positive quotes. So I've been collecting quotes for as old as I am, decades. We're just going to say decades. <laughs> and whenever I'm down, I reflect on those quotes. And if you were to join me here in my office in Carrollton, Texas, which is a North Dallas suburb, we have a long hallway in the middle of the building called Inspiration Hall. And it's filled with about 180 quotes about positive mental attitude and goal-directed behavior and self-motivation and a sense of urgency and never stopping learning and courage and perseverance and grit and fortitude, right? All of those things. And so what helps me is to focus on those things. I also keep a gratitude journal. I think it's always important to count the blessings, not the shortcomings in our life. And I, th I, I got a quote this morning uh, because I subscribe to every positive quote that I can mm -hmm. ever find. Uh, and I got a quote this morning that said, for those that think negative, Lee, keep in mind that about 3 billion people in the world today spend the majority of their hours looking for food and water, mm. right? So, I mean, think about a basic comparison. We might be so used to the, uh, the high level of, of the United States, you know, as a, as a leading country. And um, yes, there is some poverty, but we don't have the majority of our citizens foraging around and looking for food and water. That's a big difference, right? Um, so I just think fun, po positive mental attitude, positive mindset. There's all kind of kinds of research that show that people with a positive mindset think better, come up with better ideas, have more energy, are more productive, make better leaders, right? So that's foundational. The next is goal-directed behavior, whether that's personal or whether it's a business plan, it's knowing what you want, writing it down, mm -hmm. looking at it regularly. So if you were to go to my house and look on my bathroom mirror, you would see that I have the current things I'm working on right now, the goals that I have to remind me, because then in the morning, I'm brushing my teeth, putting my makeup on there right there in front of me. In the evening, I'm taking my makeup off there right there in front of me. So the whole key about goal directed behavior is thinking about what you want, writing it down and looking at it a lot. And then the, the third one is self-motivation. It's like, you know, you just, you don't have to be twice as good as your competitor. So let's think if you're working in a company, uh, you've got a lot of coworkers, you can't be probably twice as good as all of them. All you have to be is like 5% better than they are bringing a little bit more value, right? That's self-motivation. Mm -hmm. It's one more thank you note. It's one more coaching conversation with one of your team members. It's one more sales call. It's one more call to a franchisee, thanking them for the great job they do representing the brand. It's not a thousand more calls. It's not a thousand thank you notes. It's just a little bit more. Because if you think about an Olympic athlete, they win by being one-tenth of one one-hundredth percent faster than the guy who got the silver medal, right? So it's not like they're half the speed, you know, half the time to run the mile or the 10 miles, whatever it is, right? It's just a little bit better. And that self-motivation is just making yourself do a little bit more every single day. When you think about shutting down the laptop, just do one more thing. When you think about going home, just do one more thing. Uh, and then sense of urgency is like, don't put off tomorrow into what you can do today. Um, there's a lot of uh, research that shows that the highly successful people just get more done in a day. Uh, rarely does a highly successful person work only eight hours a day. I just think that that's a reality. Um, I have a quote taped right here on the top of my monitor. It's from Vince Lombardi, and it says, to achieve success, whatever the job we have, we must pay a price. Mm -hmm. So if we're talking about being a great football player, what's the price? Great physical shape. That's working out five, eight hours a day, practicing your skill, whether it's running or whether it's throwing or whether it's catching. It's again and again and again. It's getting better and better. That's a price, right? Mm -hmm. Traveling for during the season, right? Working out in the off season, that's a price. Uh, likewise, if you want to be the best parent, right? I'd be talking to great parents. What are they doing that's well? I'd be reading every book on great parenting. I would be making sure I had a positive mindset because my kids will learn from that. I'd make sure I had goal-directed behavior because my kids will learn with that. I'll make sure I was self-motivated because my kids will learn from watching me, right? Um, and so that, that works in everything. So this whole thing about to achieve success, whatever the job, we must pay a price. I think that that's important. I understand that there are things that I don't have in my life because the things that are important to me, I do have. 
I wanted to lead a company. I wanted to be successful. I wanted to get involved in the International Franchise Association. I want to make a difference in franchising. I invest time in talking to congressmen and senators and trying to uh, advance the advocacy and, and the agenda of being pro small business and pro franchising. That takes time. So that's time I'm not spending on something else. And so I think that's real per- important to understand that price that sense of urgency. And then the bottom is never stopping learning. So on one hand, you know, I've been leading people, uh, having folks that report to me um, since the, my mid twenties. And even while some people, of course, some people might say I'm not a good leader. Some people might say, am I, you know, everybody can make up their own decision on that, but I'm still reading books on leadership. Right. And I'm listening to podcasts on leadership and I'm, talking to other great leaders and asking them for, I mean, I had dinner last night with Mary Thompson, the COO of Neighborly. And we talked about girl stuff and we talked about catching up and we talked about what's going on in our lives. We also talked about business. I got three good ideas from her that I can implement in my own business. That's never stopping learning. So I think those are foundational, the five common characteristics of all highly successful people. And whenever I have the opportunity to speak to particularly high school kids and college kids, that's the message that I like to give because I think it's so critical. If we could, I wish I had learned as a young age that positive mindset was determinant of my success because I would have worked on that earlier. I think that there are always things that we might look back and say, hey, I wish that I had known this earlier, right? And one of the things that I, I've heard you say before, and I'm so glad that I heard this at this point in my career about uh, being a victor rather than a victim. And something that you've said is that uh, as women, that um, we, let's see if I can phrase this, uh, phrase this correctly, is that to find our place without pulling the, the, the victim card, so to speak, or to approach our careers as people, not as women. So can you tell me a little bit more about your philosophy on that? Yeah, and I, and I will tell you that, that I'm probably gonna offend some people, all right? And, and that's okay, right? Everybody can have their, their different opinion on this. I have never seen value in getting together with a group of women and talking about how the business world is against us. I, I just don't get it. What I want to talk about is how can I be a better leader? How can I be a better manager? How can I learn more about franchising? How can I be a better public public speaker? Those are the kinds of things I want to talk about. And so if I'm going to get together with someone like Mary Thompson last night, those are the kinds of things we're talking about. We never once last night in a multi-hour dinner said, wow, man, my career has sure been harder because I was a woman. Heck, Mary was in the military. Mary carried guns, crawled through the mud. I mean, I mean, she, she, she did the full on military thing. She would never say, oh my God, I just can't be successful because I'm a woman, right? So I think it's a mindset. And I, I think that mindset extends to everything, whether it is being short or tall or brown or yellow. I think the key is create more value than you get paid. Always be looking to make a difference. Help other people achieve their goals. And if you do those things, amazing things are going to happen for you. But getting stuck in a mindset of, well, I, I'm not going to have an opportunity because I'm a woman, that doesn't help you, doesn't help me. So I will absolutely tell you, in the 80s, there were times in my career where I felt frustrated that there was an old boys club and I knew they'd go drinking together and they'd talk about business, but there was no upside to me spending mental energy and being upset about that. The upside for me was learning more about franchising, developing my public speaking skills, learning more about leadership, doing a better job, providing more value to my employer than all those men did that went out and drank with the boss. And that worked for me. Now, if I'd been a guy, might I gotten a, my first president's gig early? Yeah, maybe, but I, it's like, somebody will ask me, so how many nights did you spend in a hotel last year? Like, you know, think about pre-COVID, like how often were you not home because you were traveling on business? And my answer is why, why do I care? Mm-hmm. I love my life. 
being in franchising involves travel, you know, getting to speak at different groups and organizations that involves travel. So why would I count how many nights I wasn't in my own bed? What's the upside? So that I go, wow, that's too many. I need to change. I would know if it was too many and I would change it, but I don't need to, I don't need to count those kinds of things. So I don't understand the value. So that's kind of my rambling answer to that question. No, that's a great answer. And part of that too, that you're, that you're kind of speaking to is the fact that you can't go back. There's no point in looking back on things like that because they're not going to serve you in the future and, and add to the value that you can bring to the table, right? If you look back and learn something like, I could have done that better. Mm -hmm. That was not the best decision. I could have handled that particular situation, that conflict in a more constructive way. If you learn, that's good. Mm -hmm. But if you just hold on to the past and fester on it, there's no upside. Am I perfect in this? I am not perfect. There are days that I have to say, you got this, Catherine. (laughs) I mean, I hate morning. I I am not a morning person. It's because I, you know, sometimes don't sleep well. And my whole life, even as a teenager, I always felt horrible in the morning. It took me an hour to become human. So there are times I got to give myself a pep talk. Got to go. Come on. Let's get in the shower. You've got this. You're going to be a great CEO today. Let's go. Literally, I have those kinds of pep talks with myself because I'm not perfect. But that gets me in the right mindset. What is something, this is what I was going to ask when you said uh, uh, what you said just a second ago, what is something that you would look back on now that was a a learning moment for you? Well, I, there were two times in my career since I've been at fast signs where one, um, I had a problematic executive that I should have fired a lot faster. And by holding on longer than I should have, it was negative for the organization. So I think when you make the assessment as a leader that someone's not right, you coach and counsel and give them the opportunity to improve. But for the wrong reasons, I kept him around too long. I'll also tell you that with one of the private equity firms that owned Fast Signs in the past, I gave into some expense cuts requests that I should not have that actually had some negative impact on the business. Um, So I think that, you know, looking back, I know now that as a CEO, and I was a first time CEO at that time, I should have said, nope, we're not cutting any deeper. We're just not going to. And as a brand new CEO, uh, I did not have the confidence in myself in doing that. I would do that today. So I just, I mean, those are the kinds of things where you look back and learn about how to be better in the future. What would you say to someone who is is trying to build that confidence and set those boundaries and build the ability to say no? How did, how did you learn how to do that? Well, you know, I do a lot of reading. I talk to successful people, um, read books on leadership. You know, I mean, one of the things that if you, you know, study psychology at all, positive self-talk is very valuable. Mm -hmm. Most people don't do positive self-talk. Most people say, oh, I'm too fat. I'm too old. I I need to lose weight. I'm not as smart. I'm not good enough. All of that programs your subconscious to have you not be good. Very often people say, well, I'm just not good with names. I would think it would be much better to say, I'm great with names and I'm getting better every day. And maybe then do some training or education on how to be better with names. One of the ways to be better with names is if you meet somebody, you say their name three times, right? Mm -hmm. I meet you for the first time and I say, Cassidy, it is just so great to meet you. And my God, Cassidy is such a neat name. You know, Catherine, there are so many of those around, right? And when I was a kid, it was Kathy. But what a beautiful name, Cassidy. Have you liked having that name? And then you use it three times. You make sure when we have this interaction and we're done, you say, Cassidy, it has been such a pleasure to spend time with you. I look forward to seeing you again. So one, I've imprinted your name on my mind three times. Then I might also think about 
who else do I know that's named Cassidy or who else do I know that has the last name Ford or how would I remember Ford? Well, that's a car. I could think of the Model T and then I can put a like a file folder in my head for a Model T car with Cassidy Ford. And I might even visualize you driving a Model T. That's going to help me remember your last name. So one, don't say I'm bad at remembering names. Tell yourself you're good. That positive mindset helps you learn more and then learn tricks like repeating somebody's name and putting a connection in your mind. Or my best friend as a kid might have been named Cassidy. And I now think, oh, Cassidy Ford, remember the Cassidy in sixth grade. And those kinds of things work, but it takes that positive mindset first. If I'm thinking I'm bad at names, I'm not even going to think to say, gosh, Cassidy, it was great to meet you, right? But it's a cool name, Cassidy. Did you, how did you like it as a kid, right? Those are just techniques that you learn, but you got to be learning. One of the things it, we sat down to have this conversation. And the first thing that you did was to give me a tip on something that I had that I had said, you know, I was nervous about something and you gave me a really great tip. And I, I think p- having that positive self-talk, you're not just doing that for yourself. Then once you're doing it for yourself, then it's outward bound too. you start doing that for right. other people. I mean, I have a I have a whole thing that I say to myself about myself. Right. I don't necessarily have to tell everybody what that is. Right. But <laughs> if I'm feeling down, I start making sure I'm doing that positive self-talk, talking about how valuable and smart I am and what a great leader I am. Now, somebody might say, well, boy, you're deluding yourself. Why would you do that? I got to have positive self-talk to get me in the right mindset so that I can do the best job possible of whatever I'm working on. And another thing about, you know, positive self-talk, I'm also a big believer in visualization. Hmm. So I will visualize before I get on a general session stage, the amazing job I do in my keynote speech. One of the most important things for me to do is not a rote repetition uh, to give my speech to myself in front of a mirror 10 or 15 times. For some people that might work, but for me, what works is visualization. So I want to see the stage. I want to stand on the stage. I want to see where the light hits my eyes. And then I want to, I don't even have to be on the stage, but I don't even, I only have to see it, but I like to stand on it a minute and do a sound check, just making sure that the mic's in the right place. And, but I don't do any other rehearsal. Now, if I've got a lot of cues for video and slides, I might do a technical rehearsal, but my technical rehearsal is going to be fast like this. It's not like go through a 45 minute keynote. Um, But the most important thing is I visualize success. That's like positive self-talk. I see myself succeeding at giving my first IFA general session keynote. I went and stood on that stand, that stage the day before, and then I spent a good hour visualizing success and visualizing being an entertaining and fun speaker. Now, did everybody think I was great? Don't know. I did get a standing ovation when I walked off the stage. You need to remind yourself. Go on. No, I'm I'm sorry. I was going to say you, it's always good. I love to hear you say that because a lot of times we as women uh, in particular forget to remind ourselves, Hey, I got that standing ovation or I would, I did a really great job at this or push ourselves and, and kind of advocate for ourselves. And you do a really great job at that. One of the things that I used to do, um, <laughs> but it was very valuable to me in my twenties and my thirties was to keep a positive strokes file. So if I ever got a note or an email from a franchisee or, um, coworker or my boss about what a great job I did doing something. I threw that in my positive strokes file. And then if I ever had a down day, I'd pull out the positive strokes file and read it. Now I don't do that anymore because I can control my mind without that. But that was so helpful for me in my twenties and my thirties. Um, and it was a great, it was a great technique, right? I'm reinforcing, I'm reminding myself whether it's reminding myself that I got a standing ovation or whether it's reminding myself about this great letter or this, what what somebody said, right? So I think that that's valuable is to find ways to remind ourselves that we really are making a positive difference uh, to re-inspire us to continue to make a positive difference. um, Because if we forget that, we could get sidetracked. Absolutely. I think of all the things you've been in the business for 30 years, you're a CEO of, of many brands. Am I allowed to say you've been in the business for 30 years? 
well, it's a hell of a lot longer than 30, but, uh, you know, for all I spend <laughs> on anti-aging products, uh, <laughs> probably not. No. Yes. I, I started in franchising in 1980. So you can do mm. math and you can figure I'm really old. <laughs> um, well, let me ask you this. What's next for you? Well, I'm having lots of fun um, building propelled brands into a multi-brand franchisor platform. Uh, you know, I started uh, with Fast Signs in um, January of 2009 and helped grow that company significantly in number of locations and average unit volume and franchisee satisfaction and in EBITDA. Took the company through two private equity transactions, really enjoyed that. And every time you get to do that, you learn more about the business. It's really great. So what's next for me is add more brands. We're at three right now, uh, looking to get to five and then to seven and then to nine. Uh, so maybe we could just say world domination. That's what's next. World domination. I think that's where we need to leave this is world <laughs> domination. So thank you so much. This The insight that you bring to the table is so fantastic. And none of us could ever be in your presence and not learn something new, which, you know, thank you for, for joining the, well, the you're, episode. You're very kind. And this has been uh, more a visit with a friend than anything else. And <laughs> uh, I really appreciate the invitation and the time. Awesome. Well, thanks so much, Catherine. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. Bye, Cassidy. Bye. Bye.